turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. I want to talk to you tonight about three ways to know when you're not in tune. You know, sometimes we get out of tune with the Spirit. We get out of tune with what God's thinking, what God's doing. I want to give you three ways to know when you're out of tune. Now, before I get into my sermon, I have to mention that uh, yesterday we uh, elected a new president of the United States. And, um, you know, there's all sorts of mixed feelings about that that people have. Um, But I want to say this, first of all, that as Christians... Uh, Our president is not our savior, okay? And that's that's the biggest thing for us as believers. People get all excited or all disappointed one way or the other. But for believers, Jesus is our savior. And the other thing that, that I've noticed is that when you do the research, you find out that Really, since the 1960s, which is about, if you, there's so many graphs out there you can look at as what happened in 1962-63 when they took prayer out of school. And our nation, <clears throat> since that point, has been on a moral decline, severely. Now, it might have been before that, but it jumped at that point. And the bottom line that I want to say is this. People, again, people get all excited or disappointed about who's in office. Um, but the nation has been on a moral decline regardless of who's been in office for over, over 50 years. And it really doesn't have, you know, people think, well, this person gets in, the nation's going to do this and go this direction. Listen, the nation has been in a moral decline for almost five decades. And a president cannot change that. The only thing that can change that is the church. Now, I believe we've seen at different times where certain actions by a president has made it worse. Um, and certain, of course, you know, as, as the church, we have to stand for certain principles. But my point is, my eyes and your eyes cannot be on a president to begin with. And um, I've heard some things going on. <clears throat> I've heard some things, um, people talking about this election, and, and I've, been, I've been seeing it for years, that it's getting more difficult, more and more difficult... Uh, for a godly Christian person that really stands on Christian principles to be in public office. And the reason, that, the reason is because if they really say what they believe about the Bible, they'll never get voted in. If they really take a stand against homosexuality and abortion and things, that if they really take that stand, they'll never get voted in. And so I even heard, uh, even this time around, some people talking and saying, well, they're going to have to, uh, if we're, you know, this person is going to get elected or we're going to have any success there, then uh, they're going to have to compromise on some of these issues. Well, if I have to compromise on my Christian beliefs, and if that's the direction the nation's going, then things are not looking very good for what's going to be happening in political arena anyway. And uh, we might as well prepare ourselves as the church that... As things go on, our hope is not in a president. It doesn't matter whether you like him or don't like him, agree or disagree. That's, that's not the issue. You know, maybe who you wanted to get in did, maybe who you wanted to did. I don't know. But the bottom line is, either way, he can't deliver what this nation needs. The only person that can deliver that is Jesus, and really that's the role of the church. And what's happening in the moral decline in our nation has way more to do with what's happening in the church than it does in politics. Amen. Amen. Now, Matthew chapter 16, verse 1. It says, And the Pharisees and Sadducees came to test him, and they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. He answered them, When it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. So Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, and they ask him for a sign. And 
he, he looks at them and he rebukes them basically because here, here's what's going on. You've got the, the Pharisees, the most religious people of the day, that many of them know the scriptures you know, inside and out. <clears throat> many of them were scribes. They wrote, uh, you know, copied the Bible over and over. They're supposed to know the scriptures. They talk about all the Old Testament prophecies. They talked about what the Messiah was going to look like. They gave prophecies about what the Messiah was going to look like. And yet, here he, they're standing there having a conversation with him and don't recognize it. Can you imagine? Standing there having a conversation with the Son of God that you've prophesied about, written about, taught about year after year. You're standing there having a conversation with him and you don't recognize him. And that this is his response to that. He says, you're asking for a sign. Isn't it amazing that you're so good at, inter at interpreting the weather? Y'all can look at the weather, and you can look at the sky and the cloudy and when the sun's doing this and the moon's doing this, and you can determine what the weather's doing, but you have no spiritual discernment. You can see what's going on in the natural atmosphere, but you have no discernment of what's happening in the spiritual atmosphere. That's really what he's telling them here in this scripture. And he says, uh, No sign will be given you except the sign of Jonah, which of course, uh, Jonah, what happened, Jonah going to the belly of the well for three days, the son of man going in the earth or the grave for three days is what he's referring to there. So he says, You're skilled at interpreting the weather, but you can't discern spiritual things. And uh, I just want to say that I see this happening in the church. You know, where we're involved in a lot, we're experts in a lot, we're skilled in a lot, but the spiritual discernment that needs to be there for the, the state that the church is in, the spiritual <clears throat> discernment that needs to be there for the end times, you don't see in a lot of people. You don't see in the church as a whole. And we as a church have to have spiritual discernment and be in tune with the Spirit to know what times we're living in, what seasons we're living in. Amen. And the only way we can know that is by having a more intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. Now I want to read to you Matthew chapter 13, verse 15. You can turn there with me. Matthew chapter 13, verse 15. Jesus is talking about the, the Pharisees, the Jewish people here again. And he says, This people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see. And your ears, for they hear. Truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see, and to hear what you hear and did not hear. So he's talking to the disciples in this instance about the Jewish people. And uh, if you look there, he'd just given a parable. And he's saying that certain groups don't understand the parable. But he's saying to the disciples, you understand it because you have spiritual ears. And so... He's saying that this group of people, as they're listening to him teach, he says their heart has grown dull. Their, with their ears, they can barely hear. And their eyes, they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, they would turn and I would heal them, he says. Now, we're not going to turn there, but in Acts chapter 28, verse 23, uh, Paul gives this same prophecy, repeats this same prophecy, which both of them are quoting uh, Isaiah 6. This was a prophecy that had been given to Isaiah 6 about what it would look like as time went on. And Jesus quoted it here to the Jewish people. And when Paul is in Rome in Acts chapter 28, he quotes this same passage. We're not going to read it again, but it's pretty much word for word what Jesus said here. Uh, he talks about their heart being dull, their ears, they can't hear, their ears are deaf, their eyes are blind, they can't, they can't discern with their spirit, they can't hear with their spiritual ears, and they can't see with their spiritual eyes. And for the most part, in all of these situations, 
actually in all three of the situations, Isaiah 6, Matthew 13, and Acts 28, this word is coming to religious people. Okay, he's not saying this to sinners. And you're going to see why in just a minute. This is not a word for sinners. This is a word for the church. And I'm concerned, and I'm, I know many of you are concerned, that as time goes on, uh, I don't see the, the church going into more spiritual discernment. I see them having less. I don't see the church having uh, uh, more understanding of the times. I see them having less. And I even talk to pastors, to be honest with you. I've talked to pastors on multiple occasions. Uh, and, and as I'm talking to them and what they see happening in the, the nation and what they see happening in their church, I'm, I'm listening to them talking. And most of the time I don't say anything because I, I want to be respectful. But I'm listening to them talking. I'm saying, that is not at all what I understand God to be doing in the church today. That is not at all what I understand the way that God wants to move in the church today. And many of the strategies that I hear people talking about in the church world, church leadership, many of the strategies that I hear them talking about are carnal. They're, they're what people can do in the flesh. They're what people can accomplish in the flesh. You see, a church and a, and a pastor can accomplish things in the flesh uh, to make up for a lack of spiritual strength and spiritual power. You can implement things in the flesh, and there's not anything wrong with doing what you can do in the natural, of course. But what we can do in the natural is not going to solve what is happening to our nation. And the church is moving to a place, um, and when I say the church, I'm talking about the body of Christ as a whole. I'm not talking about one life because I'm not believing this for one life. And we're, we're doing everything we can to fight against that. But I see the church as a whole moving to a very apathetic place, moving to a very lukewarm place. Church attendance is on the decline. Prayer is on the decline. A hunger for souls is on the decline. It's not on the rise in most, in most churches in most places. Now, this is not supposed to, I don't want this to be a discouraging thing, but I want, I'm saying this because here at One Life, we have to understand our calling, and there, we, there's going to be a remnant in these last days that do not join the flow of what everybody else is doing. There's going to be a, a group of people that do not just join in with that lukewarm, apathetic flow and just, you know, walk in lockstep with everything that's going on there, but has to kind of step aside and pull aside and say, no, no, that, that's not the way I see a church in the Scripture. That's not the way I see the power of God in Scripture. That's not the way I see the move of the Holy Spirit in Scripture. And we're going to have to be spiritually mature enough to discern what God is doing in our nation and in our churches. Amen. And so, again, Jesus quotes Isaiah chapter 6. Paul quotes Isaiah chapter 6 to the Jews that he was speaking with in Rome. And there are, there are three things that he, three problems that he, he mentions, that Jesus and Paul mention when they say this about the religious people. Number one is dullness of heart. He says, your heart has become dull. Your heart has become dull. Now, of course, you know your heart is your spirit. Your spirit is your connection to God. What does it look like when a person's heart has become dull? Maybe you could say their spirit, uh, their heart has become desensitized. It's not sensitive anymore. It's just dull. There's a, there's a dullness there. It's not sharp like it should be. You don't have to raise your hand, but anybody experienced that before? You know what I'm talking about? You, you, when you ever felt that before when you, your heart is just dull, your spirit is dull? You can be in a worship service and people are getting blessed all around you. The anointing's there. People are lifting their hands, worshiping God, and you don't feel that. You don't feel nothing. Your heart's just dull. Or stuff that used to move you, stuff that used to excite you about church, about God, about people, doesn't excite you anymore. That's, that passion has, has been snuffed out, and you're just dull. You're dull. There's just a, there's just a dullness there. I've been there, if, if nobody else has. 
I've been there where uh, I'm experiencing the life and, and, and presence of God in my prayer life and my ministry. And in times and seasons of my life where I'm in church and I'm looking around, I can tell other people are getting blessed, but I'm, I'm not. <laughs> I, I wish I was, but I'm not. I'm just sitting there kind of looking at everybody else, kind of asking God, well, how come I'm not experiencing or feeling what they're feeling? Well, your heart is going dull for one reason or another. And we're going to talk about why in just a minute. We're going to talk about all three of these things, why they happen. But your heart gets dull. When your heart gets dull, you're not convicted about sin that you should be convicted about. You're not convicted. You're not pained. You're not grieved by stuff that you should be grieved by. And this, a lot of people in the church are there on this one. There are a lot of people, and that's why I don't like it when you have conversations about, well, what's good for you may not be good for me, what's bad for you may not be bad for me, it just depends on what you're convicted about. Uh, I don't like that because what it fails to recognize is the fact that you might not be being, being convicted about it only because you're dull in your spirit. It might not be because the Holy Spirit is not convicting you. The Holy Spirit might, in fact, be convicting you about it, but you're not experiencing that conviction because your heart is dull. And so we find ourselves not being convicted about sin that we should be convicted about. Uh, you know, one of the things the Bible describes uh, as being the fear of the Lord is to hate what he hates, to hate sin. And so we have, we have believers that are participating in things that they should be being grieved and convicted by, but instead they're being entertained by. And that's a problem. That's a problem across our whole nation. Is things that should be grieving us, things that should be driving us to our knees, and things that we should be weeping over in prayer... We're, we're being entertained by them just like the world is being entertained by them. I'm talking about everything from uh, movies to books to, you know, whatever. Music. And we're being, we're not being convicted the way that we should be convicted. And it's not because the Holy Spirit is not convicting us. It's because our hearts have grown dull. When your heart is dull, you're not burdened for sinners the way you should be. You're not burdened for your nation the way that you should be. You're not burdened about injustice the way that you should be. You know, I, I made a uh, reference a few months ago whenever uh, Chick-fil-A was taking a stand for traditional marriage. And uh, I made a joke, sort of, about how on Facebook people were joking about, you know, ah, I wish we could just get back to talking about normal stuff. I'm so tired of hearing about the Chick-fil-A thing. And th this is a good example of what I'm talking about. It's like, no, we don't need to talk about something that is probably one of the biggest issues of our time. Let's go back to talking about what I cook for breakfast and if I worked out that day, and all the stuff that makes no difference. See, that's, that's dullness of heart. You're not burdened when, you're not sensitive when one of the biggest issues, most defining issues of our time and for the church, an issue that is not going away, an issue that the church is, is eventually going to experience persecution over, is coming up in our nation, we need to stop talking about that and let's, let's get back to talking about sports and working out and what I had for breakfast on Facebook. You know, Now, that reveals, though, the dullness of our hearts. That's what it reveals. It reveals how dull we are and how out of tune we are with what God is doing in our nation. It's like we don't realize, you know, it's like we don't quite realize that we should, in certain things, almost be in crisis mode, in emergency mode over this issue, but we're still wanting to uh, play games and be entertained and, and uh, you know, do things that just are selfish and just benefit ourselves instead of realizing, wow, this is a, this is a big deal that I need to get on board with and be a part of. But that's what happens when your heart is dull. You're not sensitive like you should be. Another example 
is, he says, the, the second thing he identifies as the problem is deafness of ear. So he said their heart has become dull and they cannot hear what they're supposed to hear. They're, they're, they've become deaf. And uh, I couldn't think of the movie where I saw this. I think I've seen it on more than one. But you'll know what I'm talking about. There's, you'll see this on movies from time to time where a soldier is somewhere, you know, going through some buildings or something on a mission, and there's like a bomb that goes off right near them. And, and have you seen this? Like this bomb goes off, and they fly against the wall, and they're waking up, and you kinda, you kinda, they're trying to give you the perspective of the soldier where the bomb just went off. And so he kind of wakes up, and the camera's all out of focus, and there's smoke, and there's rocks everywhere, and there's rubble, and there's this ringing in his ear. You hear like this ringing and you can't see anything and like people are looking at him and they're yelling and they can't hear anything they're saying. He's just looking at them like he's in this daze. He's like, what? What are, you, what are you saying? It's cloudy and he can't hear anything. That's kind of the picture I got when he started talking about deafness of ear. It's like there are people that are yelling and they're saying, wake up. <laughs> Can you not see what's happening in our nation? Can you not see what's happening in our world? Can you not see what God's doing in these times? And I feel like there's certain Christians that just, they can't hear it. It's just they're kind of looking in there in this fog, and they're like, what? Did you, did you say something? It's like the alarm is being sounded, and there's a group of people that cannot even hear it. And I'll, I'll be honest with you. Um... I've experienced this in our, in our church to a small degree at different times when I know that the Lord has burdened me with a strong word for our church and I'm preaching my heart out about it. I'm, I'm, I'm so burdened about it and I'm preaching my heart out about it and certainly, certainly not by everyone and definitely probably not by our Wednesday night crowd, but there's like this, it's like I've got these... Uh, I don't know, it's like trying to lift a dead person. <laughs> Just carry him around. It's like, wake up. I mean, I, I, this, it's like I've got this word that the Lord has burdened me with, and it's like there's a group of people that just smacking their gum, you know, looking at their watch, and, you know, thinking about the game, and yawning, and picking their fingernails, and, you know. And uh, I know every preacher experiences that, and that's all well and fine. But what I'm saying is that there's a deafness of ear that, that is occurring in the church where even, even when divinely inspired, passionate, Holy Ghost truth is going forth, there are certain people that are sitting in the congregation and they can't hear it. They're hearing something. They might laugh at a story or something or get some little... But they're not hearing the call that's going out. They're, they're not hearing the alarm that's being sounded. And how do you know? Because no action follows the word that was preached. That's how you know. If people are hearing the word as the truth that... You know, the word of God says that you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. And so if the truth is going forward and you're not being made free, something's wrong. When the truth is going forth in power, certain people are being set free. I mean, I'm telling you, I've seen this in church my whole life where two people can be sitting in church. One person walk away life changed by a sermon and another person that needed it just as bad was bored. The whole time. Didn't think nothing about it. Why? Their heart is dull. Their ears are deaf. They're hearing something in their ears. I'm not talking about their physical ears. They're hearing something, but they're not hearing it in here. And I'm, I'm telling you that this is costing us as the body of Christ. This is, it, and it's got to change. It's got to change. And uh, this is not what I'm believing for for one life. I'm believing that our spirits are not going to be dull. They're going to be alive. They're going to be awake. Our, ear, our spiritual ears are going to be sharp, that we can hear the voice of God clearly, that we can hear when the Lord speaks, when He says, go this way, do that, don't do that, do that, that we can hear clearly the voice of God, 
that we recognize when the, when the Holy Spirit is speaking through a person, that we recognize when truth is going forward and our spirits come alive and latch on to it and we hear that truth and that truth makes free. Amen. That's what I'm believing for. Amen. You know, this happened in Jesus' ministry over and over. Uh, I, 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 there definitely was not ever a man to walk the planet that was more anointed than Jesus. You know, you, so none of us have a chance, I mean, as far as, you know, getting better or doing a better job than what he did. Son of God had the Spirit without measure. And many, many times, more than once, would he be preaching and an entire group of people got absolutely nothing out of what he said. Why? Deafness of ear. Their hearts were dull. Their ears were deaf. They have the Son of God, Spirit without measure, truth going forth that can set them free, that can change their life. Nothing happening. Nothing happening. And look, I want to say something. I'm preaching this message tonight. And it's not a message, really. It's not like to correct or rebuke us. It's for something to rise in our hearts and go, I want to be the opposite of that. I want my spirit to be alive. I want my ears to hear truth. I want to be in tune with what the Spirit of God is saying. And I see Jesus preaching words of truth, anointed, spirit without measure, and entire groups of people uh, counting it as common, not, not getting anything out of it. And that just tells me that it has m much more to do with the hearer than it does the vessel. Now, I understand that preachers can do a bad job. <laughs> I don't doubt that. We've all heard it, seen it, okay? But even in a bad sermon, a spiritually mature person whose spirit is alive and their ears are open, the Holy Spirit can speak to them through it. The third thing, he says, is that they're, they're blind. They're, they, they have the blindness of the eyes. And again, we're talking about spiritual. Their eyes are blind. So it means they can't see. They can't see clearly what's going on. And uh, one of the ways you recognize this is that you cannot see the thing that is so clear to a spiritual believer, to a mature believer. Um, and so again, I would say, you know, things that are uh, happening in our nation or significant things that take place and so, uh, a, a spiritual mature believer will be talking about the situation and all the implications of it and someone who's blind, has the blindness of eyes, they go, are you just making a big deal out of that? That ain't what's happening there. That ain't a big deal that that happened or that's no big deal. It is a big deal, but you can't see it. You, you don't have the spiritual perspective to see past the simple event and to see all the implications of it. The same thing the Bible says is going to happen in the end times. The blindness of the eyes, what it causes is it causes the believer, is going to cause the believer to be blindsided by end time events. You see, God... Jesus prophesied about what was going to happen in the end times, and the purpose was so that when they started happening, the mature believer would be able to recognize it, see it, even things leading up to it, going, man, I see them making this decision, but I could see a few steps away where that means that this is going to be happening, and Jesus prophesied about that. But when you're blind, you don't see that. It's just, oh, that's just nothing. That's just another newspaper article. That's just another news anchor saying that. It's no big deal. But you can't see. You can't, you can't see clearly because you don't have the, the perspective that you need to have. And so what's going to happen is believers that can't see, they're going to be blindsided by end-time events. It's going to shock people. It's going to overwhelm them. It's going to depress them. It's going to discourage them. It's going to weigh them down to the point that they're going to fall away. That's going to happen. We've, we've, talked, we've been talking about that for weeks. The Bible says there's going to be a great falling away. And one of the reasons is they can't handle the pressure that's going, to, that's going to come and be associated with it. But a mature believer whose eyes are opened, it's not going to shock them. It's not going to catch them by surprise. It's not going to blindside them because they have the spiritual perspective and they, they saw it coming from miles away. 
They knew it was coming, and so they started making adjustments. They, they saw what was happening, and so they started changing their lifestyle. They started changing their prayer habits. They started, you know, getting weaned off of, of, of certain things because they saw that what was coming. And they started, they started acting accordingly. You know, this happened with us. This has happened with us at different times in our life where we could see certain things that were progressing and going a certain way. And at some point we had to make a decision to say, you know what, we're cutting that off. We're, we're cutting that, that thing completely out of our lives. We don't need it. We can do without it. We're just cutting it off because we could see where it was going and how the enemy was taking it. And we cut it off. But someone who's blind, they can't see that. They don't see how the choices they're making are affecting them. They don't see the end-time events coming together. They don't see God moving in the church and the nation. They're just totally dull and totally blind to what God's doing in the nation and in the church. Jesus prophesied this and said that that's what it would be like. He said the end times would be like the days of Noah. He said the end times would be like the days of Noah where... I, I think about the days of Noah... And I think about Noah's building this great big boat. I mean, did, did no one, was everyone just so blind? I mean, did they, did they not have enough spiritual something to look and go, you know, maybe this guy's on to something. <laughs> and uh, the Bible says that right up until the door was shut, right up until the first drop fell, they were partying. They were marrying, giving in marriage, just going about business as usual. Why would they be doing that? They would be doing that because they were totally blind to what was about to happen. Had no clue. Totally clueless that they were just hours away from being completely annihilated. <laughs> Is that amazing? That's amazing to think about. And he says that's what it's going to be like. He said, that's exactly what it's going to be like in the end times is that before the Lord returns, before the second coming of Christ, he said, it's going to be like the days of Noah. People are going to be marrying, they're going to be partying, they're going to be just going about business as usual, and then he's going to return. And there's going to be a whole group of people that are completely caught off guard, and it's not going to just be unbelievers, it's going to be Believers that have a dull heart, deaf ears, and blindness of eyes. And uh, this shouldn't su surprise us that that happens with believers because Jesus addressed it in the book of Revelations, chapter 3, when he's talking to the seven churches. He talked about blindness of eyes. He talked about putting salve on your eyes to heal, heal the blindness. He's talking to believers saying that they need to repent so that their eyes, their spiritual eyes will be open. And as a matter of fact, he ended every letter in the, the book of Revelations to the seven churches, he ended every letter by saying, he who has an ear, let him hear. Why? Because he's talking to the churches that can't hear. What are you saying? Half the people he was writing the letter to were not going to hear the truth that he was speaking. He said, he that has an ear, let him hear what I'm saying. In other words, if you can hear it, hear it. If you're not deaf, if you're not spiritually deaf, hear this word and heed it. But he was talking to a church, and I can tell you, everybody in those churches did not hear the word. We did a study on the seven churches when we were in the other building. And uh, if you'll recall, uh, not, not one of those churches uh, are in existence today or existed much past 100 years after that. Now, these are the three things he talks about. One, dullness of heart, deafness of ear, blindness of the eyes. I told you in the beginning I was going to give you three ways you could know if you're out of tune. Three ways you can know you're out of tune with the Spirit. If your heart is dull, if your ears are deaf, if your eyes are blind. And I think there's varying degrees of this. You know, when Jesus quoted, he said they can barely hear. That was the way Jesus said it. If you go back and read Matthew 13, he said they can barely hear. So they could hear something. <laughs> they could hear a little bit, but they weren't getting the full message. And I imagine many believers are kind of like the guy that Jesus prayed for the first time. He said, can you see anything now? He said, well, I see men walking as trees. <laughs> I can't quite see as clearly as I need to, but they see something. But that can change, amen. 
Now, I want to make this statement to you. And uh, this, these three things come about from, for different reasons. The dullness of heart, spiritual deafness, spiritual blindness. That it comes on people for different reasons. Okay? It comes on people because of neglect of the things that you should be doing as a believer. Neglect of prayer. Uh, neglect of spiritual disciplines that we should be a part of. It becomes of indulging in the flesh. But if you could break it all down to one simple word, it, one simple phrase is that it really comes as a result of disobedience. And Paul, I forget the exact scripture reference where it is, but Paul talked about it. I believe it was Paul. Talked about it and said that he talked about a, a believer whose conscience is seared. And, you know, if you can imagine part of your hand or something being seared, being burnt, you know, kills all the, the nerve endings where you don't have feeling anymore in that part. And that's, that's what he's referring to is that it's like their heart has been seared through perpetual and repetitive disobedience that their heart doesn't feel anymore because it's been, it's been seared. It's been made hard. It made uh, where it has no feeling. And so... Repeated disobedience results in these three things. Now, I want to focus, I, I, I don't think this, this next thing we're going to talk about probably applies to uh, anyone in here. Because I think most of us, if we were experiencing this, that's probably how we would arrive there is through disobedience, neglect, uh, laziness, giving into the flesh. That's how we would arrive at this place. But when this prophecy was given originally in Isaiah chapter 6. That's not exactly the way that it came. And you can turn there with me, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. Let's read it. We're all familiar with this passage, Isaiah 6. It's where Isaiah sees the Lord seated on the throne. He's having a vision of God. Train fills the temple to glory, comes in and he says, I'm an unclean... How many of you remember whenever... He says, I'm a man of unclean lips. Sorry, let me finish that thought. He says, I'm a man of unclean lips. And uh, how many of you remember a few weeks ago we were talking about your mouth? Talking about speaking, speaking God's word, the importance of your mouth, the importance of speaking words of life, the importance of not speaking words of death. Isn't it amazing that when Isaiah came in contact with the presence of God, the first thing he was convicted about was his mouth? He came into the presence of God, and he says, Oh, I am a man of unclean lips. Why is it that when he came into the presence of God, the first thing that he was convicted about and had conscious knowledge of his sin was about his mouth? That's not a coincidence. Anyway, that's a side note. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. So this is after that. And it says, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go to this people and say. So what God was saying is, I've got a very intense message that needs to be delivered to the people. It's not going to be popular. It's not going to be received well. So who wants to go? Who can we send? Who will go for us? You know, it's whenever I've heard this message preached a lot at youth camps and stuff because they're, they're preaching it to youth like, you know, who will say yes to the call of God on your life? Who will go for us? Who can I send? And uh, definitely that applies. But really what he was saying to Isaiah is you're not going to be liked for this. this you're not going to be popular. It's not going to be well received. But who's going to go? And Isaiah says, I will go. So he said, go and say to this people. Now listen, listen, this is the word. This is where this prophecy that Jesus and Paul repeated, this is where it first came from. He said, go and say to this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes lest they see with their ears and hear with their ears, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. When this word was first given, I know this is going to be hard for some of us to swallow. When this word was first given, it was giving as a, prop, a proclamation of judgment 
on a people so that they could not repent and therefore receive the judgment of God on their life. That's when this word was given. That's, that's what's happening right here. He says, go and declare this over the people. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy, blind their eyes. Why? So that, or unless, they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. He says, cause them, cause their heart to be dull, cause their ears to be deaf, cause their eyes to be blind, so that they cannot turn to me and repent and be healed. So it's a word of judgment that is pronounced on the people. Now, this is, it goes back, you know, uh, to the book of Exodus where Pharaoh is over Egypt. He's got the children of Israel in his grasp and they're his slaves. God does all these miraculous things, gets ready to, to bring the children of Israel out. And how many of you remember, I mean, multiple times you read where it says Pharaoh went to repent. He said, Pharaoh would have repented, <laughs> but God hardened his heart. And people have tried to explain that away in all sorts of ways, and well, that's not exactly what it meant, and you know, God would never do that. But listen, hardening of the heart is an act of judgment. That's what you have to understand. And that's what's happening here, is that because of repeated disobedience, because of repeated rebellion, a proclamation of judgment is made on a person where they cannot repent. Now, you say, well, man, that's, that's heavy. <laughs> that's intense. Well, let me say a few things on that. First of all, Jesus and Paul quoted this scripture in the New Testament. So it's not just Old Testament. Paul also addressed the issue with Pharaoh in the book of Romans when he was talking about it. And he was explaining why, why it happened, why it happened to Pharaoh. In short, let me say this. Eventually, uh, judgment will, will come on this nation. It's come on every nation before us and eventually judgment will come upon our nation. We cannot keep going the direction that we're going and accepting the things that we're accepting and uh, calling good evil and evil good. We can't keep going on that direction and judgment not, not come to our nation. So it's one of two things that's going to happen. Either judgment's going to come or revival's going to come. Revival will happen when the true word of God goes forth in a way that pricks people's heart and they repent. Revival, re repentance will have to precede revival. People will have to repent and turn from that. We can't just go the same way we've been going and say, well, you know, we're not, we're not, we're going to live unholy. We're going to live apathetic. We're going to live, little, but Lord, let your revival come down and just bless kind of what we're doing. You know, revival, repent, true repentance will have to precede revival. And so, I've said this before, that repentance is a gift from God. The ability to repent, let me say it like that. What I've, what I've said before is conviction is a gift of God. When you experience conviction, it is a gift. Because we see evidence in Scripture and we see evidence looking around us today that people are not convicted. They're not convicted of their sin. They're not convicted about what they're doing. They have, why? Either because their conscience is seared by their own choice or something else that, you know, for example, what we're reading about. But for whatever reason, they can't repent. And when you can't repent, it's not good enough, or you, you, do, you, don't find your play, you don't find yourself in a place where you have godly sorrow and you're able to repent over your sin, then you find yourself at a place of... Um, where your heart is hard and your conscience is seared. And the Bible says that godly sorrow must precede repentance. And so 
conviction and sorrow over your sin, conviction and, and uh, sorrow over your sin is a gift from God. It is a gift from God. And so when we see it, we, can't, we, don't, we don't need to take that for granted. But what I see in this scripture, what's being said, and everyone who repeated it, Jesus and Paul, what's being said there is, is that because of repeated disobedience, because of repeated rebellion, the gift of conviction and repentance was withdrawn from them. And that's, you know, difficult for us to grasp, but we do not have an unlimitless amount of time on this planet. We do not have an unlimited amount of of opportunities to make ourselves right with God. And so, as long as we're feeling that conviction and that need to repent, then we need to take advantage of that because it is, a, it is an absolute gift. Amen? Now, I want to end the sermon tonight by talking about a passage of Scripture in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. And while you're turning there, I'll finish reading Isaiah 6 for you. So he, 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 he pronounces this proclamation of judgment on the people. He says, Make their hearts dull, ears heavy, eyes blind, so that they can't see, hear, or understand with their heart and, and be healed. And so Isaiah looks at him, he says, How long, Lord? In other words, how long is this going to happen that their eyes uh, are blind, their ears are deaf, their hearts can't understand, and they can't repent? How long is this going to happen? And the Lord replied, he said, Until the cities lie waste without inhabitants and houses without people, and the land is a desolate waste, and the Lord removes people far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. So basically until there's a complete annihilation, wipeout in in this instance. Now, this is why it's dangerous, you know, to take repentance, take conviction for for granted, because we already know that there's going to come a point uh, in the end times where repentance is no good. For example, when you stand before God, uh, you know, if you never repented on earth and you find yourself standing before God, that's not the time to repent, even though people are going to be trying. There are going to be people standing before God in that moment, and they're saying, God, I didn't know. Forgive me. I didn't know. And and no, the, the time for repentance was on the earth. So even if we don't see this type of judgment until the throne room of God, then still we have to understand that we have a window to make things right. Amen? Amen. Now, 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. All sorts of uh, groups of people are starting to gather to David. This is, he's at uh, Hebron. In 1 Chronicles chapter 12, 32, and these people are beginning to gather themselves to David and is talking about the different tribes and men and groups and clans of people that are gathering to him. It's describing them a little bit. And in verse 32, it says, Of Issachar gathered men who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Two hundred chiefs and all their kinsmen under their command. So the sons of Issachar are described here as men who had understanding of the times and they knew what their nation ought to do. That's what it says. Of course, their nation was Israel. They had understanding of the times and they knew what their nation ought to do. In every generation, I believe that there's been the people of Issachar a group of people that had understanding of the times and knew what, what was going on, what the church should do, what the nation should do, what direction they should go. And uh, again, when I, when I started ministering this sermon tonight, my goal here is for us to see that we can be in that group. We can be a church that has an understanding of the times. We don't have to be dull. 
We don't have to be completely out of tune and out of touch with what God is doing. In our families, in our nation, in the church, we can have spiritual understanding and spiritual discernment about what's going forward. But I want to say this. If you feel that the dullness of heart, deafness of ears, blindness of eyes, if you feel that that is coming on you in any way, then now's the time to deal with it. You know, um, now's the time to deal with it when you can still see, you can still hear. Maybe it's not as clear as you want it to be, but you can still uh, deal, deal with it. And no matter what, what part you're at, I mean, I certainly say this for myself, no matter where you're at, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to have a, a spirit that is more alive and can understand more. I'd like to have spiritual ears that can hear better than they do now, and I would like to have spiritual eyes that can see better than they can see now. And I believe that's one of the reasons that Paul uh, was constantly praying for the believers, that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened, their spiritual eyes would be flooded with light, that they'd have the spirit of wisdom, spirit of revelation on them, because I think we can always see more than we're seeing now. We can always hear more than we're hearing now. We can always be more sensitive and more alive in our spirits than we are right now. 